Uh, welcome to the, to the CASA seminar today, and it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Oliver Sander, professor from TU Dresden for numerical methods of partial differential equations. And it's, of course, a special pleasure because Oliver is also part of our open project for elastic materials and cell shapes, which we have here together also with Ivo Spazzarini. Um, where Asita and Gentian are the students of that project. So it's great to have uh, the whole day today for, for working on these things and discussing them. And of course, so Oliver's research interests are broader than that, and he will tell you about them. And with that, I would say, um, yeah, the stage is yours. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Thanks. Uh, hello to my talk, uh, wherever you are. <laughs> Um, I have no idea even how many of you there are. That's, that's, um, yeah, well, I'm Oliver Sander. I'm, as you said, I'm a professor at the Technical University, and I'm doing mainly work in, in solid mechanics and finite elements. And I, I, as far as I understand, there's many people that may not know what finite elements actually are. Don't be scared, right? <laughs> Every time, I'll be explaining it a little bit. Every time you see uh, the word uh, finite elements, you think piecewise polynomial function, basically. It's really not more than that. Um, and then the geometric part is what finite elements are standard. They're standard technique in the numerical analysis of partial differential equations. The geome geometric part is, is what um, I'm going to explain you a little bit uh, of what that means. Okay, what interests me is, um, well, partial differential equations basically for functions that map from a domain into a, a nonlinear manifold. The standard partial differential equations that you learn in, in textbooks and in introductory classes, they're like the Laplace equation or the heat flow equation. What you're looking for is, is a, uh, like a temperature distribution or a pressure distribution, a scalar field. Yeah? For every point in space, you have a number. Right. Or if you do basic elasticity, you have a deformation. For every point in space, you have a position where it moves to on the load, right? And like scalar fields or points in free space, they, these are all linear spaces. You can add them and you can multiply them by scalars, right? What I'm interested in is um, problems where for each point you don't have like a number or a vector in free space, but something that comes from a nonlinear space, something like a direction. Like a field of direction vectors, for example, that you cannot add, you cannot add two directions, you cannot scale directions, right? Um, that's a little bit exotic, right? Most problems do not have this structure, but and there are a few examples. And so let me just start with a few examples that you can have. And the simplest one, the one that got me started, is from solid mechanics, where if you do simulations and modeling of things that are very long and thin, like strings or wires, um, it doesn't really make sense to consider that as three-dimensional objects, right? So technically they are, but for modeling purposes, you say that's something, that's something one-dimensional. And um, one way of modeling at the so-called Cossarat rods, named after two French brothers, Cossarat, um, which said, okay, I'll describe uh, something like a wire as a line in three space. Um, and on the line, there, there's a little, sequence of cross sections, you know, circular, maybe circular shapes, and they're rigid. They don't move, you know, which is not like, which is an assumption, a simplifying assumption, right? Um, and then the uh, uh, configuration of such a wire is described by well, the line and the orientation of these cross sections. They cannot bend, all they can do is rotate, right? Um, and if you write this down, you get two variables, Right, it's one dimensional, so it's if it's functions on a on an interval, and they map into, into three space. That's the line, the center line, right? And then you have this family of for each point in space, you have the orientation of the cross section, and that's a map again from the interval into SO3, the group of all rotations, right? And you can visualize that in, in different ways. For example, here, here you see on the right hand side in, in white. You see the line, and then at each point, you have this little frame, orthogonal frame of, of vectors that symbolizes this rotation. Right? There's a, the, green and, the green and red arrows, they span this, 
orientation. So here you have the, the example of a map into a, into a manifold. So three is not a linear space. Um, that's one you can do the same thing for two dimensional problems. If you look at simulating stuff like metal sheets or plastic film, stuff like that, it's, it makes sense to consider that as a, as a two dimensional object. So in, in reality, what you're looking for is three dimensional like this, but it's really thin. So let's, uh, let's consider it as something uh, two dimensional. And then there's a whole zoo, there's all business of different models of how to describe this. And the, the simple or one approach is to say, well, it's two dimensional. So what you have is on the two dimensional parameter to main the map into R3. Um, okay, the so called Kirchhoff theories. Uh, and then the models that say, well, that's not actually enough. You need a bit more. And they say, well, these such a sheet, it can bend and it can stretch. But really, if, you, if it has a thickness, such models, such objects, they can shear a little bit. And if you want to describe the shear, you need an additional degree of freedom. So people said, OK, let's have a little unit vector field on the model. So these unit, they are unit vectors, but they can tilt. And that way, you have shear in the model. Um, OK, and there again, it's, this is a field of directions. It's not a linear space. If you can go one step further, some people, that's a bit more difficult to see why you need this. Some people claim that you need these vectors. They need to rotate. They need to be able to rotate, which you cannot have here. So they introduce, um, well, an, an entire orthonormal frame. Yeah, like Bishop frame. Hmm? Okay. Yeah, it's, it's the frame. And then again, you have a map now from a two dimensional domain into SO3. These are Kosovo shells. That's the second. And I'm going to show you some numerical examples of that um, later on. That's for mechanics. There's one other example that I have on my slides. In, you have, uh, if you look at ferromagnets, right, you can model them as little. Well, magnets, little thingies that have a plus side and a minus side, and they point up or down, and they don't have, depending on the model, they don't have length. And there's various fun things that you can do. And this is, people call this skirmy, and it's a quasi particle. It's basically, it's a knot, it's a two dimensional knot. Yeah, it's kind of funny. This is a field of unit vectors. It's clamped to, they're clamped to all point upwards um, on the right hand side or on the boundary. They minimize this energy, never mind the details. Um, and the true minimizer would be a constant field, all vectors pointing up, right? But not all configurations are, they have different, there are different homotopy classes. You cannot deform them all continuously into another one. So this is, this is a knot. Um, this has higher energy than, uh, than, the, than the constant function. But you cannot reach the constant function from here by continuous deformation, just like you cannot, you know, open a knot by just pulling. Right? Um, yeah, that's quite a quite an intriguing, quite an intriguing object. This game. Okay, if you want to do numerical analysis for this, so you run into certain problems, right? So we are interested in these nonlinear films. And what you see is that, well, if, you, if I now consider the sets of all these functions, like the set of all unit vectors on a given domain, um, that I'm losing a lot of structure that I'm using, that I'm used to using, right? In particular, these are not vector spaces. I cannot add two direction fields and get another direction field. Well, there's no addition defined for directions. There's no scalar multiplication. I cannot define a, an orientation by a number and get a different orientation. Right, so there's no vector space. Um, there are no norms, not a norm space. There are no scalar products. In fact, the entire field of linear functional analysis, what PDE people use a lot, right? No use, right? Because linear functional analysis is about vector spaces. Um, if, you, if I cannot add and multiply it by scalars, um, I don't have polynomials. I cannot have polynomials in these functions. And here come the finite elements. If I don't have polynomials, I cannot have finite elements. Yeah. Because now, OK, for all those who don't do numerical analysis, what are finite elements? The finite element method to solving these problems is to say, in this big, forget about the manifolds, if I want to 
find a temperature field or a density field, what I the set of all possible temperature fields, it's an infinite dimensional space, and infinite dimensional spaces are difficult. So the idea is let's approximate this infinite dimensional space by a finite dimensional space of functions. Let's restrict our attention to easy functions. And the easy function is let's triangulate the domain and consider piecewise polynomials. That's the method of finite elements. Yeah? You approximate an unknown function by a piecewise polynomial. But now, if you have this nonlinear factor spaces mapping into nonlinear spaces, there are no polynomials. And as a consequence, you don't have piecewise polynomials and you don't have finite elements and you're stuck. Right? So what do you do? Um, as, these, as these problems are interesting for, from application point of view, people have looked at, at ways to, to, to model such, such problems. And um, so here's a brief overview over some things that people have tried. For example, variations of the finite difference method. Well, which, which is completely different than, than finite elements, basically, where you say, OK, my fun, I'm solving some sort of partial differential equation, let, which contains derivatives. Let's remove, let's replace the derivatives by difference quotients and kind of do that. You can kind of do that uh, in these manifold settings. It works OK. But, uh, even the original finite difference method has lots of disadvantages. So I'm not, not really kind of interesting from a mathematical point of view, but let's skip that. Um, then people have said, which is kind of natural to say, if I um, say, if I have a direction, a field of, of direction vectors, how about we do a triangulation of the domain and I'm, I say, okay, at the grid vertices, I want a direction vector, I want a unit vector, and in between, I don't mind if, if I don't have the unit length in between, right? The direction vectors, the directions in R3, they're naturally embedded into R3. So let's just pretend we are in R3 and interpolate in R3. And it kind of looks like this. There's now a sequence of drawings like this, which, which I well meant to be interpreted in this way. Let's say you have a triangle, a domain, and on the, on the, on the vertices of the triangles, you have given values. And now you need to interpolate between them to get your polynomial, basically. How I prescribe the values at the vertices and how do I get, how do I construct vertices in between? And so this is pretty much your thing. You have a triangle, you have a flat triangle, and now in between you want to stay on some sort of manifold, right? Um, one way is just to take the flat triangle. This is your green triangle, basically, the blue eye. I interpolate linearly between the vertices on the unit sphere. By that, I leave the unit sphere, but I that's intentional in this method. Okay, okay well, um, you can do that. That works. Theory is complicated. Um, that's one. That's one way. It's not particularly pretty because you're not you, you're not using the geometric structure. But hey, um, and you can say, okay, if I have three values on the sphere, like you know, this and this, and uh, it's small. This. I can take a tangent space at one vertex, lift it all up onto the tangent space, interpolate there, and, and project back down. Right? That works. Um, that kind of works if you. That works. It doesn't work well if the, the, the points are very far away from each other. Um, it depends on the tangent space that you use. So there are some people have these nifty strategies where you kind of switch between these tangent spaces and it's the functions that you get, they're not necessarily continuous. And mm, that's something that you can do as it's disadvantages too. And then, well, yeah, I'm just going to skip those. Um, OK, so that's. That's the prologue. Um, there have been various approaches. I've shown you some. I've skipped a few. They all kind of work, but none of them, in my opinion, are particularly pretty. Um, in particular, some of them, they use structure of the manifold, like the Euler angle approach it only works on a sphere. Some are non-conforming, right? You need the embedding. Um, and what I want to do, or what I wanted to do is, um, 
of construct a new way of new type of interpolating functions that are well um, geometrically conforming by which I mean that, that I construct a set of functions they generalize piecewise polynomials and they really map it to the manifold at every point right it's real it's truly a, a field of unit vectors or a field of orientation matrices at every point right um, never mind the h1 conforming I want this to work not just for the spheres or the orientation matrices. I want this for pretty much arbitrary manifold. Um, I want high approximation order because some of the methods that I've shown, they work for linear interpolation and not much more. Right? I want any order. And then, yeah, well, you need in mechanics, you need certain invariance properties. Basically, when you move the, the observer, when you move everything around in space, it shouldn't influence the mechanics. That's what frame invariance means. Um, okay, and I hope that now you won't be surprised when I say that if we generalize that, that the important part now is to generalize polynomial polynomials or polynomial interpolation. Right? I have values at Lagrange points. Basically, I'm I'm generalizing Lagrange interpolation now. Right? Finite elements are piecewise polynomials. The easiest finite elements are piecewise Lagrange polynomials. And basically, every time I speak about finite elements here, I'm thinking Lagrange polynomials. It works in more general cases, but that's not part of this talk. Um, so we want to generalize piecewise Lagrange polynomials. And the, diff the difficult part is the Lagrange polynomials. The piecewise part, that's kind of easy. So how do we, how do we generalize Lagrange interpolation for functions that map into some Riemannian manifold map? And there is a few ideas, a few things that you can do. And I'm going to show you two. Um, the first is, again, to use an embedding, right? Here is the, um, the sphere again as an example, right? I have, again, I have three values somewhere on the sphere. Here's one. Here's one. Here's one. I int want to interpolate between these values on a triangle, but I want to get a sphere valued field. So what do I do? Do a trick, yeah. right? Um, I do the linear interpolation, and then I do radial projection. Right? And that works on the sphere. That works on other manifolds as well. You just have to replace the radial projection by some other projection, right? Um, so that's the idea. Um, we call that projection-based finite elements. You take some embedding space, you interpolate in that embedding space, and then you have this some projection operator, um, and you project in some reasonable way onto the manifold. Um, and if you think that through, that gives you a well-defined family, a well-defined interpolation rule. Um, it's differentiable, like the projected function is differentiable. You even get um, nested spaces. Like if you increase the order, you get subs um, subs you get larger spaces that in the, the, the lower orders are contained in the higher orders. Um, and you get these invariant properties that I mentioned that mechanists are interested in, that I can basically rotate the whole thing and not, not change the behavior. Um, that kind of works. Well, but it feels natural. And I mean, of course, it depends on the embedding, right? It depends on the embedding. I have to say, um, yeah, there, there's going to be a slide coming up where I do the pros and cons of the, the, the this and the other method. Um, I'm, I say that I want this for any manifold M, and it does work for any manifold M. In practice, the manifolds that people are interested in are the spheres and the rotations and certain ellipsoids and nothing really fancy. And I've done this for the hyperbolic half space for fun. Um, <laughs> But I don't know any application. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this, in many cases, this works from a practical view, viewpoint. Um, from a from an aesthetic viewpoint, uh, from an aesthetic viewpoint, I'm saying, well, this is not pretty. I don't like embeddings. Right? There's this whole school of differential geometry that says that embeddings are not nice. <laughs> So can we do something without an embedding? So this is, in a way, this is one thing that you could try for your um, 
it's a different way of projecting from the green triangle onto the sphere, um, which is prettier and more general, but it's heinous to work with. Uh, it's not <laughs> no free lunch, you know the same, right? So can we do something intrinsic, something that works without an embedding space? <clears throat> right, so here is another uh, drawing. This time is now for for second order. Just for change, I have a, a flat triangle. Um, I have six Lagrange nodes here, and I have for each of the six Lagrange nodes, I have um, values on my manifold that are those. And now I want to interpolate. I want to do some sort of Lagrange interpolation between these six nodes on this nonlinear space. Um, uh, so let's take one step back and say, if this was all linear, what we would what would we do? Well, if this was real, if this was linear, there'd be something like a Lagrange basis, and then we'd say, okay, the if I want to know the value of the interpolating function at the point psi, then I would evaluate the, the shape function, the, the basis, the Lagrange functions at that point psi, multiplied by the vector. About multiply by the value of that Lagrange function and sum it all up. It's a linear combination of the of the weighted Lagrange functions. Um, and the trick now is this: well, if you want to do this on a manifold, you can't do this, right? Because we have a sum, and there's a scalar, there's a scalar multiplication in here, right? And there's a basis of the Lagrange space. No way you can do this on the manifold. Right, and the trick now is to see that you can actually write this as a minimization problem. This is what's written here. The, the value of the interpolation function at the point psi minimizes this functional. Right, that's a one line at see this. It's, it's a convex functional, and you compute the first derivative, and you get the left hand side of this. Right? And this is well known. This is this is old. This doesn't even have a name. Everybody knows this, basically. Um, the trick is that now this you can generalize, right? Because what it is, it's basically the norm is a distance. Huh? It's a distance squared. And there's still a product. But the product is now between the distance, between the distance and the shape function. That's not a problem, right? So let's generalize this. We just replace the norm by, by some distance on the manifold, right? You say there's Riemannian, we have some sort of distance measure, it's a metric space somehow, and then we just define this to be generalized Lagrange interpolation. And that gives us this um, interpolation function. Right, and this is, you know, to show what's going on, this is very pretty, this is very elegant. Um, but you know, it's it's defined. The value of the interpolating function is defined as the solution of a minimization problem. So it's a bit convoluted, and in practice, you know, we now have to go and check whether whether you can actually use that in practice. Right? Um, and you can to a certain extent. First of all, you have to check well. Do these minimization problems actually have solutions? We may not be. And that depends on, um, on the order. If you, um, if you uh, do first order interpolation, then the shape functions, the, sorry, the Lagrange functions, the finite element term shape functions. The Lagrange functions, they're all positive. Um, and then the well posedness of this is actually a classic result by Hermann Karcher, which you can find in the literature. Um, the, the entire construction is known in the literature. It's called, people call it the Kasha mean or the Riemannian center of mass. So yeah, just to be to be clear about this, this is not something we, that I invented really, this formula. Um, I found this and I had the idea I could do finite elements with it, right? But the formula as a way to to average, people use this in statistics to average between values on, on, on manifolds. So and it's locally convex in some sense. Yeah, the idea is that, um, that's what we'll look at it. The idea is that, you know, it's on the manifold, if all the points are close to each other, then the whole thing kind of looks like a Euclidean space, and then, 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 then the functional is going to be uh, convex. Yeah. Yeah? 
Um, if they are far away from each other, then you're running into trouble. Mm -hmm. um, and this is basically um, yeah, what this theorem here says. If you, the Cauchy proof, if you have second order Lagrange functions, then you can get uh, negative values here. And then this proof, Cauchy's proof doesn't hold anymore. And my postdoc, Hannah, and I, we, we proved that uh, you still get well posed minimization problems if these functions are close enough to each other. And if they're far enough, there really is no uh, minimizer or there's no unique minimizer. The classic example is if you interpolate on the sphere and you take one value at the North Pole and one value at the South Pole, um, it could be anywhere on the equator, for example, right. anywhere. So that's basically an assumption you have to put in. And later in a finite element or approximation context, the argument basically is if you make your triangle small enough, then on each triangle, the values for that triangle will be close, close, yeah, close to each other, and then you're okay. So in practice, this is not much of a If you do very coarse grids, then I see my program, my calls fail. Um, but that's not really an issue. Okay, uh, the next thing is, okay, now I have this weird uh, formula to... Uh, to compute function values, but is this actually a differentiable function as a function of x, of, of psi, right? Um, and you can prove that it is, right? So I can really differentiate with respect to psi, well, actually as many times as I want. When you say, sorry, when you say close enough, is there any estimation available for that? There are, yeah, the uh, formula is, uh, it, there is, if, the statement actually says if all values are contained in a ball of okay. radius, and the radius depends on the convexity radius of the manifold. Okay. It's it's a sufficient condition. It's not a necessary. Token sufficient conditions. Um, no, not not necessary conditions. So it's not completely classified when that works. Or it doesn't. Okay. So it's it's a smooth function. The function of psi. That's important. For applications, you have all these invariance properties that you want. I'm just going to skip this. And now, um, okay, now we're almost done, right? I've two, show you two different ways to generalize Lagrange interpolation. Um, and all we need to do is turn this into a piecewise Lagrange interpolation, and that just works as in other finite element theories. You say, okay, the domain which was this square here, I'm now triangulated. But find an element that people call the grid, right? And then I'll define the space of geometric finite elements as the set of all functions from this set omega into the manifold M that are continuous and generated by one of these interpolation rules on each triangle. Natural to natural generalizations of piecewise polynomials or piecewise finite of finite element functions. Okay, and now I, the idea is that I use these functions to approximate solutions of partial differential equations, like for example these shearing fields and Cossara theories, or these uh, direction fields of the micro of the the magnets, the ferromagnets. Um, I'm going to show you a few examples in a second. Who you knows what the solar space is? These guys do. <laughs> so, uh, for the theory, very, very important is that these functions are actually solar functions. Right? This is really one of the things that sets this method apart from other methods because it this allows you to do a lot of a lot of theory. All these other approaches that I mentioned, people do that mainly in kind of an engineering context where you just you know, kind of implement it. it sounds like a good idea you implement it you test it it seems to do okay and then you write a paper um not much very little theory but with this property the fact that that these approximation functions are part of the space that the actual problem is well posted um that is a big advantage if you want to do rigorous analysis for these for these methods because mathematics mathematics people they want to know you know I'm, I'm approximating solutions of partial differential equations by some sort of 
approximating function, I want to know how good is my approximation, right? And for that, something like this is very, very helpful. And are the embeddings, are they dense in, in, in some of the spaces? So that, uh, for all grids? Or yeah, the, the space of all these geometric finite elements, are they dense in the space of sobolev functions from well, gut to m? Well, this, this space here yeah. is defined as for one fixed grid. So yeah. it's finite dimensional, it cannot be dense. Ah. Right. Yeah. For each grid, for each this, grid. Is, this is a finite dimensional space. Yeah. Or yeah. something. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Right. Now, if you want to. Now, the question is if you do this, if I keep refining the grid, yes. you will get something dense. And that's, yes. Yeah, it is. Yeah. You know, we and we even show show rates. I erased the part of that part of the talk in the, in the train this morning because I thought it would be too technical. But, yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe this, but yeah. uh, okay. They think there's one slide. Okay, on this. Um, okay, so in principle, now I can approximate functions, solutions of partial differential equations with it. Um, but um, there are a few practical questions, right? So, and the main practical question is this weird definition of a function value as a solution of a minimization problem. Can you actually um, can you actually work with these functions? Um, and you can. And there are various aspects of this. The first, the definition is here. This is the definition you know. Um, just to to recall it. And the first question is, well, in practice, in my computer code, how do I actually evaluate such a function? Um, and the solution is I evaluate this numerically. I really do compute, I really do solve minimization problems. For each evaluation. For each quadrature point. And each, if I do a direction of a function, I loop over the quadrature point, and at each quadrature point, I need the value of the function, then I solve this minimization problem. You have to solve that every at every quarter point. Yeah. So the whole thing is not it's not a cheap method. Yeah. Um, it's not as bad as it sounds because this is you you're minimizing it's a minimization problem on your manifold, right? Um, and as I said, the manifold in practice, that's the unit sphere or the um, unit the or the, the orthogonal sphere. matrices. So this is low dimensional. And it doesn't depend on the resolution of the grid. But you need for these ferromagnet things, I'm solving a three dimensional minimization problem at every point. But it's something that you have to do. Um, so, this is certainly a drawback of the method, right? Actually, evaluating these functions is, is non trivial. Um, what about derivatives? I claim there are derivatives, but how do you actually compute them? Um, and the trick to compute them is to use the implicit function theorem. First, you need derivatives with respect to x, that took psi. Um, and the trick is if you say, well, the minimizer of this functional is a stationary point of the derivative of the functional. So here's the stationary the derivative. So if I say, okay, the derivative of that must be zero. And if I take the total derivative of that, I get this expression. Um, and the two black formulas, they are known. And the red one is the one that I'm looking for. Right? This is the chain rule, basically. Right? Um, so the, one, the derivative of the interpolation function with respect to psi is the solution of a linear system of equations, a small linear system of equations, which is kind of strange. You know, you'd expect the, the derivative to be more complicated than the value. But once you have the value getting the derivative, is actually easier. To just solve this again, the equations. Uh, not particularly cheap, but it's easier. Okay, so values, derivatives, and then um, if you want to do, you know, Newton methods for like for some sort of harmonic energy or for whatever PDE you do, you need higher derivatives. These are not enough. You need derivatives. You need a second derivative. No, you need derivatives of these two quantities with respect to the values that you are um, interpolating. You need the derivatives with respect to the uh, the values, the values that the Lagrange points. So how do you do that? 
in principle, you can do the same trick again with the total derivative. Um, so here's the formula for the derivatives of the gradient with respect to xi derived with respect to the values. You see the red thing is what I want. The black things, I all have them. Um, so this works. It's just, you know, just kind of difficult to get right. right? So I spent three weeks of my life implementing this for the sphere and harmonic energy. This made me unhappy. Right? It worked eventually. Um, if it was this, and then there's more, right? I need one further derivative. Uh, so okay. this is, I never tried this. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah, well, third, you need a third order, which is uh, luckily then I found out that there's a thing called algorithmic differentiation, um, which computes all these things automatically for me. And that basically saved my career. Um, <laughs> or which maybe is known as automatic differentiation in neural nets. Like yeah, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. There's a standard yeah. name of automatic differentiation yeah. and then yeah. the autograph. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 I don't see people say it should be algorithmic differentiation. <laughs> no, mind. it's a state automatic. Um, yeah, and with that, the whole thing becomes feasible. Right? And um, what, what's actually implemented in my code is these two formulas. Right? This and that, um, and even that is the nice thing about it. This is purely it depends on the geometry of them. It does not depend on the partial differential equation that you're solving. Right? You do this once for every other for every m that you care about, mm. and then you're set. And all the rest is done by the automatic differentiation system. And with that, it it's okay, and you can you can use this. Okay. Um, nevertheless, you look at this and you, you think, well, it's still pretty complicated, right? How about this other method with the projection? Um, that was much easier. Why not use that? And the answer is it's not, not quite that easy, right? And that depends on M. Uh, it really depends on the manifold. Let's say, again, my example, the sphere. If you do this really for, sphere, for the sphere, so for fields of direction, direction vectors. You interpolate and you project and the projection is the radial projection. You just divide by the norm and you're done. That is really simple, right? So in case of a sphere, I'd always argue in favor of this method, work with the projection, right? It has all the other nice properties. You can even compute the, the derivatives with respect to Xi in closed form, very nice, very fast. The problem is for other spaces, it's not, not as nice. For example, you remember the other important space that I care about is uh, the orientation matrices. So what, what's the projection into the orthogonal matrices? If you look that up, you find that um, in order to project into orthogonal matrices, what you do is you do the polar decomposition and you take the orthogonal factor. Polar decomposition means I can write every matrix as a factor of an orthogonal matrix and a symmetric matrix. Right? And I do this decomposition, I throw away the symmetric matrix and the polar factor. That's the closest point projection onto all three. Um, so, how do you compute that? There's quite a large literature on, on computing that. Um, there are closed form. Formulas, which are surprisingly long. Um, the best that I found is an iterative construction, right? In a, in a paper by by Hayam, uh, which basically says take the matrix that you're. This is the matrix that I want to project, and then set the call this Q zero, and then iteratively compute this. You know, take it, invert it, add it to itself, repeat. Right, and that does converge to the polar factor. Right. Um, so that's not, that's not super complicated, but it is an iterative method, right? It is an iterative method for something that we thought was easy. So it's not all that easy. Um, and particularly it's not much cheaper than the, the minimizing this argument mm -hmm. thingy. Um, if you want to do the derivative of that, you can compute it by a similar recursion, that's okay. 
Okay, that's okay. That's something that you could live with. It, it gets a bit worse. Some people, for example, care about the space of symmetric positive definite matrices. Right. This is mainly because this is what comes out of uh, diffusion tensor diffusion tensor imaging machines. Right. Um, but they are an open set. Right. SPD matrices are an open set in in the space of all matrices. So there is no such thing as a closest point projection. Right. And supposedly, I guess you can wing it and just do something similar. And yeah, I never tried this. So, depending on the space that you're in, this projection based interpolation may, or may be a good idea or it may not. So it depends. I'm close to the fancy pictures. So, I'm looking at my watch and I talk for 40 minutes. And not much more. So um, let's just try this. Um, and here's the first, like the, the, the first toy example that everybody tries. That's the harmonic energy. That's basically the generalization of the Laplace equation. So um, we're looking for a function in a two-dimensional domain mapping into the unit sphere, so field of unit vectors, if you will, minimizing this energy. It's the harmonic energy. Um, <clears throat> and the the nice, the nice thing about this example is that we know the solution, and it's the inverse stereographic map. is known, you can show that it minimizes this energy. And so we, I solved this problem numerically, and I compared the, the errors um, with, uh, compared the solution against the stereographic map, which is the true solution, and then I measured the error. And what I would expect, find it out with people that measure like, L2 in different norms, Basically, and depending on the norm that you use to measure the error, you, um, what you're always interested in is, well, if I, if I make the grid finer, the error is getting smaller, but how much smaller is the error when I refine the grid? And this is um, these, these colorful lines. This is the mesh size, the size of the triangles. The vertical axis is the error, and you see if the mesh gets finer, each small triangle gets smaller, then the error gets lower. And from theoretical considerations or from, from the linear case, we expect certain orders, right? In the, for example, in this norm, if I do first order interpolation in the linear case, I could show that um, doubling the, or well, halving the size of, of each element, I get a quarter of the error. Right? And the behavior is that's the black line. The black lines in there are what I would expect from the linear theory. And you see that asymptotically, I really get the error behavior. Right, and the, the right plot is the same in a different norm. So this really, the, the, the technique reproduces apparently the behavior that you know from linear, from, from Euclidean finite elements, finite, finite elements. Um, okay, um, does it make a difference what kind of interpolation function? Uh, I use what's plotted here is runtime, right? Left for the sphere, right for the orientation matrices. Um, dashed is uh, geodesic finite elements, the one with the minimization problem. Solid lines are um, the projection technique. You see that for the sphere, the projection technique is really an order of magnitude faster. Mm -hmm. um, for the orientation matrices, where do you need to compute the polar decomposition, uh, doesn't really make any difference. Right? You have, at each quadrature point, you have to solve a small system anyway, and it doesn't really matter. Yeah, the same. Okay, I don't know how much you care. So the, here's, <laughs> have you, you've seen these optimal errors, right? And now the question is, can we prove that? Can we prove the optimal errors? And then it's quite something to be, uh, that I really like, because at this point you get to in invent a lot of new math. And if you look into the standard theory, you find results, the standard results are something like this. Um, U is the actual solution of your PDE. UH is your finite element solution. The difference between the two is the error. 
And then you have to do this and measure this in some sort of norm and standard is the H1 Sobolev norm. If you don't know what the H1 norm is, never mind. It's just some norm. Um, and what you usually get is that this is bounded by um, some constant times the power of the diameter of the triangle. This is H times some measure of regularity of, of your actual solution, which is something that you don't, which you cannot compute, but it's there. So in the standard, so this could be like a Sobolev half norm, some measure of regularity, how differential how integral is the whole thing. And you see that in this manifold setting, this expression doesn't make any sense at all, right? There's no difference between two functions. There's no norms, right? What, what should I do with this measure of regularity? Um, and so we got to invent lots of generalizations. And, uh, it gets very technical at this point. Um, but it did work. And um, we're able to show that the, the error behavior is actually, it does follow these black lines that you, that you see in the plots. Right? For the harmonic energy, we can actually prove this. And that's long and technical. It's not not very pretty in a way. It depends. It's much better than what existed before, but yeah, it's not as general as as I would like it to have. But hey, and if you've proven that for this H one error, H one error means I use this particular norm of measuring the error. Um, Finite element people are always there's like a standard set of norms that we're interested in, um, and there's this H one norm, and then there's this. Uh, L2 norm, which uh, is related and the old theory is completely different. Um, so these are two different papers. There's one paper for one norm and one paper for the other norm. And it works for both. So, okay, and I think from now on, it's only pictures and examples. So here is the skirmian again. Um, and that was actually covered by the theory. So we could prove that Approximation, these finite element approximation to these Skirmian fields have an error behavior, have this optimal error behavior with this power of the mesh size. Um, so that proves it. And if you measure it, you, you see the same thing. Right again, um, you see the, the black lines, which is the error as a function of the mesh size of the We call it mesh size. What it means is the mesh resolution. Um, and you see that the measured lines follow the black lines. For some strange reason, this yellow line here decays faster than the black line. I have no idea. <laughs> I've been looking at this for years. I have no idea where this comes from. <laughs> um, well, that works. Here's another example. Remember, uh, you can use this for these different, there are these families of, of shell models where you model some the mechanical behavior of, um, um, of something that's very thin, two dimensional, and then the third dimension is very thin. Um, what you see here is a, this is a photograph. People took a, this is a sheet of plastic and it's clamped on the lower and an upper body, uh, up lower and upper boundary, and it's sheared. Right? And if you do this, just take a shopping bag, and if you do this, you see these wrinkle patterns forming. Mainly what you see is you see these diagonal wrinkles. If you look closely near the boundary, you get higher frequency wrinkles, people call it hierarchical wrinkling. At the vertical boundaries, the thing is slack, and you kind of see it kind of wavy-like. We want to see if you can reproduce this, this behavior. So we looked at a shallow model. So we tried this with one of these OSR plates. So now here's a model which has a, where such a film is described by mid-surface and a field of orthonormal vectors. Right? And there's a whole you know, involved theory that you can do with this. And a friend in, in Essen, Patrizio Neff, uh, who, well, analyzes, invents and analyzes these models. Um, don't try to, you know, understand the formulas here. This is just, you know, to show off and show that it's really difficult and complicated <laughs> formulas. Uh, um, so basically what we're doing, we are minimizing a functional that depends on the mid-surface. This is the mid-surface. 
deformation, this is the field of rotations, and there is a, an energy functional, it's an integral over some density, never mind the details. And we're looking for minimizers of this energy now in the space of, of these finite element functions. Um, and it turns out that the, you capture the behavior of this quite well. This is the photo, this is the simulation. Um, uh, that, uh, you see all the main features, you see the, the main wrinkles, you see the higher frequency wrinkles, you even see this, these waves here, which are, do not really look the same as these waves, but <laughs> this is so well conditioned, this is, so, this is not something that you, that you have to get. Um, for full disclosure, I usually people in mechanics they 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 ask me at this point, for a picture like this, do you need a model so complicated as the one that you're using? And the answer is, I don't think you do. You can possibly. A friend of mine has reproduced this with a simpler, with a one director model. Um, yeah, but still. The, even the simpler models are not much simpler. <laughs> so that's that. Um, my talk used to end here and this morning in the training. I thought, well, I have to do some. This is actually this is two years old, so I have to put something something new. And so what Patricia and I are doing now is uh, try to generalize this into shells where where the stress free conf uh, configuration is curved. Right. And he said, oh, let's do non orientable surfaces. Let's do the movie <laughs> strip. Okay, why the movie strip? Oh, it's fun. Okay. <laughs> yeah, he's right. It is fun. And this is, you know, this is work in progress. And this is why it's painted by hand and all. So um, I'm now looking at deformations of objects that are not diffeomorphic to something in the plane, like this movie strip. I spare you the details. There's an energy functional. You have to write this correctly with you know solar spaces on manifolds, and then there is an energy, and the energy has has to take the curvature. And the interesting thing about this is the is the shell model because it has to take the curvature of the of the stress-free configuration into account, and then the finite elements are are kind of similar. And so one example that we tried was this. This is from a paper. Where the, which is its photos again, um, and they showed with uh, this is paper, materials paper, and you kind of they, they twist it, and the fun thing is that you you know you can kind of completely flatten, you completely flatten the in the cylinder without actually much of uh, of membrane stretch, so this folds but it doesn't really stretch. I mean, paper is a a lot of people try simulating paper because paper is, it doesn't stretch at all. You can only bend it. Um, and this is pure bending and still you can basically flatten the entire cylinder. Um, and we tried this numerically and you kind of, this is the wrong way around, I noticed this morning. Um, so here's the undeformed cylinder and then you twist it a little bit and it flattens a little bit and uh, you twist it some more and it flattens some more. It doesn't look quite like the, the paper. The, the creases are not as sharp. I don't really know. It's work in progress. Right? So <laughs> it kind of looks like the photos. Um, that's that. That's, that's an upcoming paper. And then finally, just for the, for the fun of it, here's the Klein bottle. <laughs> <laughs> it has no physical meaning, but uh, it's not a readable. That's fun. So these are this is these are two pictures of the undeformed Klein bottle, uh, just from different directions, and then we clamp the whole thing here and pull, and then let gravity pull, and then the Klein bottle just that's just for show. <laughs> okay, and that's the talk. Uh, thank you. Thank <laughs> you.